Sixth of Sun's Dawn, 4E202, Day 174. After breakfast, Maurice and I rode to Whiterun. We visited Farangar on the pretense of looking over his stock of magical supplies. When he turned his back to rummage through some scrolls, I swiftly and quietly slid the book I had borrowed under some items littering the desk. My movement must have caught his eye because he turned around and admonished me to put that down. At least Farangar did not realize what I was actually doing. He simply thought I was disturbing his things. Maurice was too busy studying the wizard's large map to notice anything. We traveled towards Eldergleam Sanctuary in the rain. I kept glancing at the sky and straining my ears for any sign of dragons, but we were lucky not to meet any along the road. As I was hobbling Winterwisp just outside Eldergleam Sanctuary, I heard the fearsome sound of a dragon roar. I anxiously scanned the sky, but could not see the beast. Knowing that Maurice had no hope of surviving a dragon attack, I hurried him into the sanctuary. The cavern was as I remembered, a place of great peace and beauty. Asta, a sort of self-appointed priestess of the place, welcomed us back. I asked her about the Elder Gleam, and she said no one could get near the tree because of its thick roots that have overgrown the path. She mentioned a weapon that the tree feared and would lift its roots for, and I showed her Nettlebane. A look of horror swept across her face, and she begged me not to harm the tree. I explained that I had no intention of harming the tree. I simply wanted to collect a little bit of its sap. I tried to tell her about Danica's plan for using the sap to revive the Elder Gleam's child tree, but Asta would not speak to me again. Whispering apologies to both Kinnereth and the Elder Gleam, I used Nettlebane as gently as I could to move the roots from the path. Maurice followed me, and when he realized what I was doing, he grabbed my arm and begged me to stop calling me a woman of violence. I explained Danica's plan to him, irritated at having to repeat myself once more. Maurice must not have been listening when I told Asta the same thing. He dismissed the idea of using Elder Gleam sap to restore that stump in Whiterun. So much for his reverence for the Gildergreen. Hands on hips, I asked him if he had a better idea. His eyes lit up, and he said he thought he could convince Elder Gleam to help. With the light growing more fervent in his eyes, he led me up to the base of the tree and knelt in prayer. To my amazement, a small sapling sprouted underneath the grand tree. Gesturing at the sapling, Maurice bade me take it to Danica and tell her that nature's way was through renewal, not maintenance. I reverently collected the tiny replica of the Elder Gleam and packaged it safely into the outer pouch of my backpack. I spent several more hours basking in the beauty of the sanctuary. Asta partly forgave me for disturbing Elder Gleam's roots when I showed her the small sapling. She lovingly brushed its delicate pink flowers and told me to care for it more carefully than a newborn babe. I made bold to ask her if I could collect some alchemy ingredients while I was there, and she nodded, chiding me with a stern look not to harm any of the other plants. Maurice decided to stay at the sanctuary, for which I was glad and relieved. As Lola and I stepped back out of the cavern into the fading daylight, the roar of a dragon jolted me back to reality. I peered up and saw the beast circling high above us. As I ran towards an open area to get a better view, I tried to land a few lightning bolts, but they all missed. The dragon circled twice and then flew off to the east. 
I watched until he disappeared from view. Thinking we were safe for the moment, I made my way back to Winterwisp. But I could still hear the echoes of a distant roar resounding from the mountains. Climbing the small rise at Elder Gleam Sanctuary, I spotted him. The bronze-colored dragon was circling bone-strewn crest. I sent a blast of lightning at him, and he rounded on me. The ground shook as he landed, and terror gripped me as we stared into each other's eyes. Contempt shone back at me through the bright depths. He drew a deep breath. Before I could move, I was hit with the blast of his furious fire. I'm not sure how I, or my weapons, survived, but I quickly knocked an arrow and retaliated in my own puny fashion. As I reached for my mace, Frostbiter, the dragon flapped his great wings and lifted into the sky. I breathed a prayer of gratitude to Akatosh and rummaged in my pack for some potions. Healing, magnify armor, enhance weapon skill, and a resist fire potion all went down my throat as fast as I could swallow them. The next time the dragon landed, I was ready. Trying to stay on his side, out of immediate range of those razor-sharp teeth, I dug Frostbiter into his flesh over and over again. More of his flames licked at my armor, but they could barely damage me now. With a furious roar, the wounded dragon took to the sky one last time. My arrows seemed ineffectual, so I waited for him to land again. When he did, I seized the opportunity as I had before and jumped onto the great creature's head. Frostbiter crushed bone and dug into flesh as I swung with all my strength. The dragon fell beneath my blows, bellowing in fury as he died. I felt the dragon's anger and his disbelief at defeat. Then all thought was consumed as his power filled me. Expectation tempered my reaction, for this was now the fourth time I had slain a dragon and absorbed its power. I didn't think I would ever become accustomed to it, but knowledge and experience at least made it more bearable. Darkness had fallen while we battled. By torchlight, I made my way back to Winterwisp and rode through the now silent night towards Darkwater Crossing. I found the miners huddled by their campfire in fear. They had heard the echoing roars, and one of them had seen the first dragon circling close to their settlement. With my armor battered and singed, and my body bathed in a mix of the dragon's blood and my own, my arrival did not immediately put their fears to rest. They began to shout, and one woman started a low keening, but I ignored them all and loudly announced that the dragon was dead. I had hoped that this bold, bland statement would quiet them down, and it worked. Mouths that had been open in shouts and screams were now open in stunned silence. They gaped at me, perhaps for a few moments, or perhaps longer, I do not know. Turning my back on the gathering, I laid down my gear and calmly walked into the nearby pool to wash. Once I was clean, I turned back to the fire and laid out all my wet outerwear to dry. The miners were recovering from their fear and their shock, and questions flew fast and furious. Yes, I really did kill the dragon. With my mace. Yes, it breathed fire. At me, yes. No, the fire did not kill me. I do not know why. No, this was not my first dragon. Yes, I am telling the truth. My fourth. Indeed, I said fourth. And so it went, until their curiosity was satisfied. It was rather uncomfortable sitting there under their gaze. They looked at me as if seeing something greater than themselves. It occurred to me that this must be hero worship. I did not like it. 
I was not above these folk. The gift that I was given did not make me somehow better or worthier than they. As evening wore on, it became clear that I was going to have trouble coping with people's reactions to me. The only person who behaved in almost normal fashion was Anarchy. She listened to all the conversation, and she watched me with a keen eye, but she did not really treat me differently. As I was cooking up a quick meal, I overheard her speaking with her husband. She was asking him to adventure with her and reminding him that they used to enjoy exploring the world together. He silenced her with a raised voice, saying that all he wanted now was for her to put a warm meal on his table. I know it is not my business, but it made me angry. Women should be as free as men to lead the lives they want. I drifted to sleep on this thought in a borrowed tent by the fire. Seventh of Sun's Dawn, 4E202, Day 175. Fortunately, it did not rain during the night, so my things were almost completely dry when I dressed in the morning. I saddled Winter Wisp and checked my gear. Praise Kinnereth that I'd had the foresight to pack the Elder Glean sapling in my saddlebags when I left the sanctuary. Otherwise, I fear it might have been lost to the dragon's fire. While I was preparing my things to leave, Anarchy Cragjumper approached and begged to come with me. I hesitated, not wanting to get involved in her marital situation. But then her husband came out of the house, frowned, and called her a lazy bounder. Anarchy looked me in the eye and said that she was leaving, either with me or on her own. I warned her that I could not promise her safety. I warned her that I did not know when I would be back this way. I warned her that it was very likely I would have to battle more dragons. With each warning, her eyes grew brighter and more hopeful. With a sigh, I gave in. I do not know if I will be able to keep her safe, and I do not know what will happen to her husband. Perhaps this is her destiny. Only time will tell. We headed north for Windhelm, as I remembered that a grieving family there was in need of an amulet of R.K. that I'd found. From there, I intended to travel south to Riften and return Grimsever to Mjol. I couldn't wait to see the look on her face. In Windhelm, we first went directly to the marketplace to resupply. While shopping, I struck up a conversation with a grizzled Nord warrior named Brunwolf Freewinter. When he made reference to Ulfric only caring about the Nords, I asked him to elaborate. It seems that Ulfric refuses to provide assistance to anyone who is not a Nord, even when people are being terrorized in his hold. For example, there is a group of bandits known to prey on Dunmer refugees, but Ulfric won't send any troops to deal with the brigands. So I offered to take care of them. They were hiding out in Stony Creek Cave. Brunwolf offered to show me the location on my map, but I already knew where it was. After that, Anarchy and I finished our shopping. She needed some gear and better weapons, and Oengol was happy to sell us some of his stock. I also bought up all of the alchemy ingredients at the White File. Finally, I stopped by Hilevi Krulsi's stall to get some fresh produce. I had hoped to run across Torbjorn Shattershield in the market so I could give him the Amulet of R.K., but he was not there. Neither was he at Candle Hearth Hall when we went there for lunch. The innkeeper, Elda, suggested that we might find him at their home, and gave me directions. We met up with him along the way, and he was grateful for the amulet. I hoped his wife would find comfort in having the token. It was too late in the day to head for Stony Creek Cave, 
so I decided to visit the docks and see if I could find any information about ships traveling to and from Solstheim. I found the captain of the Northern Maiden, a man named Galland Saltsage, but he told me that he is not going back to Solstheim. He spoke of masked cultists who came on board there and how he and his crew have no memory of the voyage. All they remember is being docked at Windhelm with no sign of the cultists. It seemed my investigation had hit a dead end. Another ship captain, Kiar, asked me if I would be willing to dispatch a former sailor from his crew who had turned rogue and was leading a gang of bandits at the trader's post, right outside of town. Eager to rid Skyrim of more bandit scum, I agreed. While at the docks, I noticed that all of the dock workers seemed to be Argonian. One of them, Scout's Many Marshes, spoke to me about their situation. He complained that Torbjorn Shattershield hired them as cheap labor, paying them only one-tenth of what he paid Nord workers. That was outrageous. I offered to speak to the man on their behalf. I hoped my good deed for his family would at least make him listen to my arguments. We headed back into the city to find Torbjorn. Along the way to the Shattershield residence, we passed by a young boy and his nurse arguing outside of a run-down house. From what I could gather of their conversation, a boy living in the house was trying to contact a band of assassins called the Dark Brotherhood. It was said that he'd been performing a gruesome and taboo ritual called the Black Sacrament to get their attention. I could not fathom why a youngster would do such a thing. Frankly, I was shocked that someone so young even knew about the assassins or the bloody ritual. Call it motherly instinct, but I felt the need to intervene. I felt the need so desperately that I picked the lock on the front door and let myself into the house. As soon as I entered, I could hear the child chanting the ritual's words over and over. Then he shrieked, Die, Grilla, die! in such bloodthirsty tones that I went cold inside. There was a note on the floor, which I read in hopes that it would contain information to shed light on the situation. It was a note from the Jarl's steward. The boy's mother had recently passed away, and he had been sent to Honor Hall Orphanage in Riften to live until his 16th birthday. If he was supposed to be in Riften, why was he still here? Who was caring for him, and who was this Grelod person that he hated with such passion? Perhaps she was a relative who had refused to take him in? I walked further into the room until I could see the child. He was kneeling on the floor before a semicircle of lit candles. In front of him was a human skeleton. With his back to me, he stabbed the floor with a dagger each time he chanted the ritualistic words, which I will not repeat here. I approached the boy, laid a hand gently on his shoulder, and asked if he was okay. He stood quickly and got very excited, believing that I was an assassin from the Dark Brotherhood come to answer his call. I explained to him that I was not, but he refused to listen. Patiently asking questions to draw the boy out, I was eventually able to piece together the entire story. His mother got sick one winter and never got well. After she died, the Jarl sent the boy, Aventus Aretino, to live at Honor Hall Orphanage. The orphanage is run by Gorelod, a woman that the boy calls a monster. He says that she mistreats all the orphans and she deserves to die. Although I refuse to murder the woman, as the boy requested, I will investigate the orphanage when I reach Riften. Maybe there is something I can do to help. 
Leaving that unhappy house, we continued our search for Torbjorn Shattershield. We found him browsing in the marketplace. I pulled him aside and bluntly asked him to pay the Argonian dock workers their fair due. I figured a direct attack was the best approach. To my surprise, he agreed without hesitation. He claimed he was only doing it as a favor to me, but whatever the reason, I was glad to see it done. Since it was only mid-afternoon, we ventured outside the city to deal with the thieves at the trader's post. They were no match for us, and we headed back to the city almost as fast as we had left it. Back at the docks, I informed Kiar that the trader's post was clear. I also informed Scout's Many Marshes that all the Argonians would now be receiving fair wages. As we were leaving the docks, one of the guards stopped me to say that there was a dragon roosting in Mount Anthor to the northwest. Sweet R.K., another one! Where can they all be coming from? Although I do not relish another battle, I should probably seek out this dragon before it wreaks havoc on the surrounding area. But for now, I am tired. We had a long, busy day, and I am looking forward to a quiet night at Candle Hearth Hall. <laughs>